Hi, and welcome back to IVF Daddies. I'm Richard Westerby, and today we've got my great friend Matt Brown joining us. Hello, Matt. Hi, nice to be here. I've known Matt now for about nine years. Um, and we first met at a um, presentation that I was doing about baby making, realistically. Um, and he has lived in New York for about 15 or 16 years, knew all about surrogacy, knew that he wanted a family but didn't really know where to start. Um, so Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you are today. Okay, I'm a father of a soon to be six year old uh, son, uh, Richard. And honestly, what a great name. Can I just point that out? <laughs> Come on, you, the minute you discovered he was gonna be called Richard, it's sort of, thank you so much. And I'm going, yeah, no, yeah. sorry, my dad's called Richard. Yeah, it's my dad's name, <laughs> but it, I will take credit. You can take credit because honestly, yes, I am immensely grateful uh, to uh, you and uh, your book, honestly. Yeah. yeah. Um, One of the few people who've actually read it. Thank you. <laughs> read it. It had post-it notes throughout. It had uh, bits highlighted. So yeah, it's probably better than any textbook I've ever had to go through. And it's readable. <laughs> and it's readable. That's because I wrote it. I use very small words. Short, sm small words. <laughs> <laughs> Not so good with the larger words. Um, but you no, made it accessible. I, there we go. I made it accessible. I do a lot of that. I make things accessible. Thanks. You are a single dad yes. to Richard, who is gorgeous and lovely and the nicest little child anybody could ever meet. Thank you. Um, there, there must be some incredible highs and some not so incredible highs. Um, tell us about your journey in getting to having Richard and post having Richard? Going really far back, um, I knew at 16 I wanted to be a dad. Um, but yeah, growing up, I turned 50 this year. So I grew up in the 80s uh, when being gay was really not a good thing and uh, the press were very anti it. And um, I remember even on Tomorrow's World, them actually dealing with IVF. Oh, wow. And, uh, so this was the huge thing of test tube babies um, as they were known back then yeah. and thinking science fiction was becoming real. And therefore, actually, if you didn't need a woman and um, regular procreation, then there could be a, the possibility that I could become a dad. Did you just say regular procreation? <laughs> ah, yes. Ah, ah, sex. Little words. Again, I make things accessible. Regular procreation means sex. No, I'd actually. Or argue, does it? I would actually argue there's a difference because uh, sex can be between two men, and they yeah. they are never actually going to unfortunately procreate. Can keep by trying having sex. They can try. Yes, trying for years, still not pregnant. So, um, yeah, they. <laughs> I had that hope, and then obviously, you know, it. People in the press, whether. Um, I want to say Elton John, but I'm sure there were other celebrities before Elton John um, that made me aware of uh, growing generations as a US-based uh, uh, surrogacy center. And that, you know, that spurred on the hope that... And this was when you were in the States or when you'd moved back? Because you were in New York for yeah. how long? Uh, nearly 16 years. 16 so, years. Um, no, this was even before I moved to New York. So... Oh, um, wow. And knowing the kind of costs, because I was looking at it even when I first moved out, um, and just looking, what's it going to cost? How am I actually going to do this? So I said it was pretty much a, you know, it was a lifestyle choice, but it also meant a choice of saving to try and actually get that amount of money to then actually be able to do it. Um, weirdly, as much as inflation in the world has kind of gone up. The costs quoted when I was first looking at it and ultimately what I did pay were very, very different, as right. in much less. You actually paid less good. than you thought you were going to have to pay. Yeah, I think I, initially when I started looking, it was, you know, 220 to 250,000. Right, uh, you know, US dollars. dollars. Yeah. And, um, but yes, when you know that, well, this is the price ticket of the life I want and therefore, yes. For going luxury, you know, never been a label person. And so it was a matter of going, yeah, you save, you invest, and you make sense, and you can try and build the life you want. I moved back to the UK 
um, because my ex partner, uh, basically told me that if I wanted a family, I would, you know, move to London and, you know, with that, him or without him, with him, because okay. that's where he wanted to live. And, um, we would raise a family and I, he canceled out about three days before we left. Um, and he was coming later. I boarded the plane and realized that I don't think he is. And if it dawned on me that if he doesn't, I'd survive. And you could do it on your own. I mean, it's a very, it's a process, but you can do it on your own. It's, um, that's just it. I mean, uh, I, everything fell into place. Um, I focused on discovering who I was, you know, I'd been out of the country for 16 years. Um, I wanted to rediscover London, discover who I was single. I took up running, cycling, and just wanted to be me before jumping into anything else. Which is, which is an amazing thing to do. I think discovering who you are, <clears throat> excuse me, discovering who you are enabled to be able to give the best of you to somebody else is, is phenomenal. I mean, um, when you jump countries, you often find that a lot of your identity is kind of reflected back off the people, you know, so when you suddenly go somewhere where no one knows you, you've got that ability to either recreate yourself. Or actually turn around and go, well, who am I, you know, without, you know. Or recreate yourself using the best parts of you. Yeah. Because if you know who you are and you've got the good and the bad, because we yeah. all have an equal amount, so I, I, I would say pick those things that are good and then reinvent yourself on that. That's it. You're not defined by others. You're actually able to define yourself. So, and yeah, I ended up at a party uh, for Diwali, as, which is right by Guy Fawkes. Best coincidence ever. Everybody at this party was a uh, part of this, uh, the IVF show in London that you were part of. People came with their kids. It was same sex couples. It was, if you ever wanted, my parents call it a uh, God incidence. Yeah. You know, it's, it was just meant to be. I was lucky enough that uh, one of the uh, dads there actually said, well, if you want to go to the show tomorrow, I'm going, come with me. And I thought, yeah, why not? I'd been, you know, adamant, I, this is something I wanted to do when the timing was right. And then suddenly this was the world's biggest nudge of going, well, you've been given this opportunity and lo and behold, I met you. And 13 months later, I had Richard. Which is amazing. Cause I, I think actually that was the first one that I had ever spoken at. In fact, I think it was almost like my debut talking about surrogacy and baby making and all those things i if i remember rightly really yeah God, you see and it took 13 months that was quick yes wow incredibly quick see when you get that nudge you just got to follow it and 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 get your baby yes it's amazing um so obviously you're now doing this as a single dad because your ex decided not to come to england and i'm happy more fool him i say um Tell us about your support network. Tell us about how you, cause it, it, it's a lot of work, right? How do you, how do you manage doing everything? If I said I cashed in my, um, my pensions, um, both in the U S and UK and bought properties so that I could be, um, a landlord and therefore a stay at home dad, which to me, a lot of the people that I worked with and I loved my career in New York. I loved my job. It was, you know, something that energized me every day. But it was realizing that a lot of those people gained their life to work and their families, they felt suffered because of it. Or maybe that's me projecting. But that's amazing. I mean, you, I, you're so right. So many people sit in the office thinking I've got to do this to be able to create the life I need to give my children. And actually by being present, that's phenomenal. Being able to cash it all in and just be a stay at home dad is, is fantastic. And because the only thing we've got is time. It is. I mean, this doesn't mean that I stay at home and, uh, you know, do nothing. You bake. <laughs> they do bake, but, um, yeah, it's, it was getting involved in, um, you know, Richard's nursery and becoming a governor of the schools and then several schools. Um, it's discovering that you've signed up too late to get your child into, uh, the scouting movement and realizing that, ah, huh, okay. 
I will volunteer as a leader and they will probably find an extra space for Richard. Oh my God, I love it. So not only are you a stay-at-home dad, a single dad, you're a scout leader, you run, you cycle, you are running a successful business, renting out housing. Like, how are you single? Like any single men out there looking for a date, let me know because this one over here, thank you. Catch. Man. I'm like, there you go. I will not say no to that. <laughs> <laughs> like going bright red, but yes. Um, <laughs> you haven't got red, honest. So your support network obviously includes a lot of friends, which is amazing, but also includes your parents who are very instrumental in your life. And I, I've met, I've been lucky enough to meet your parents and they're very, very nice people. Thank you. Um, how are they involved with Richard and his upbringing and, and how have they molded a little bit of who you are and what you're bringing into his life? Wow. Multiple parts to that question. Mm. I live a hundred miles away from my immediate family. Actually, they're an hour and a half drive away, which makes it quite easy and nice. Um, working for myself just meant that, um, the properties I rent out are in Norfolk. So I'd actually go up to Norfolk, you know, one day a week, uh, or occasionally a, a couple stay with my parents and Richard's actually had time with his grandparents, with my siblings and his cousins. And that way the family bonds, which have been important to me are something that he has. Yeah. Um, I have fantastic neighbors where I am and some fantastic friends. So, uh, colleagues that I used to work with and even one of their mums, Tina actually babysits which allows me to what do, I do beaver cubs or beaver scouts, I should say. I don't know what that is. What's that? Okay. So the scout movement actually began with boy scouts and scouts. Right. Um, they then came out with beaver, uh, scouts, which is, so, uh, cubs is eight to 10 and then 10 to 12 is scouts. And I think it goes on beyond 12, but, um, you then have beavers beneath that which is six to eight. And in the last few years, they came out with squirrels. Oh dear God, it sounds like going out into a gay night. You've got the squirrels, the otters, the bears. I'm like, okay. the scout movement, who knew they preempted all of that? They truly <laughs> did. Um, and well, no, I have to say they are very LGBT friendly. You can even get a, you know, a Scoutmaster uh, rainbow f flag uh, necker. Interesting. So I, for some reason, thought that the scouts was very homophobic. It had a history of, uh, that, especially in the U S right. Um, uh, but now it is much more inclusive. It is open to boys and girls. Uh, so our troop, we have probably a, you know, a, a good equal mix between oh. girls and boys. Um, and it's fantastic. Oh, amazing. And then within your support group, I want to talk about a friend of yours, Julian, fantastic, um, who I've also met and who's very nice. Um. Tell us a little bit more about that. I was part of the London Front Runners, and I think it was actually through one of them that I was connected to Julian. I mean, one of the things of uh, being a solo parent or, you know, through surrogacy is the amount of other people that have then asked questions or you've connected and you've worked with um, and tried to steer them on the path or connected to you. And... Yeah, I got connected to Julian, who is phenomenal. We went on holidays um, together with Richard, went to Turkey. I mean, I think we've done five, six countries. And Julian's just a platonic friend? He is. He is as fant fantastic inside as he is outside. This guy. Oh God, this should turn into a dating show. Um, IVF daddies, come to us if you want to find one. <laughs> I I think he's taken, actually. He, oh. Very nice man. Good. Very nice man. And yeah, no, J Julian, lovely guy. So he started hanging out with you, learning more about the surrogacy process, how to parent. And um, then what happened? Then he actually asked one day how I'd feel about him actually using the same egg donor. And as much as he was worried about my reaction, I'm there thinking, yeah, you know, to me, I couldn't think of anything more. I want to say fun, but fun's the wrong word. I liked the connection because actually he has a daughter called Alice and Alice is, she's phenomenal. She and Richard 
because they share uh, the uh, the egg donor mum, um, they do look so alike. Uh, well, they're brother and sister. Yeah, that's it. Julian wanted, he, he'd asked, he said, look, I'd like a little Richard. <laughs> but, he, but he chose a girl. <laughs> and um, yeah, so lockdown happened um, and Julian is Swiss, um, but naturalized uh, in the UK as well. And I think the whole plan was, you know, his family were going to go out and be with him when Alice uh, was born. And suddenly it was a matter of going, great, I've got to apply for uh, permission to be there uh, for the birth uh, from the US government. Because you couldn't travel to, into the United States during COVID unless you're an American. Which thankfully myself and Richard were. So you went so, with him. So um, he, yeah, we went with him. We were there for six weeks. Amazing. And it was fantastic. I mean. So I think this is the most amazing thing. So you have a friend, you are my go-to person whenever I've got a, a single dad who wants to look at raising a family. So you start explaining the process to him. You go through it all. He starts hanging out with you and Richard and goes, wow, this child is amazing. Can I use the same egg donor as you? He uses the same egg donor to make embryos, yep. then has a surrogate and has Alice. Yeah. So basically you now have Richard and Alice who are in effect siblings, right? If, yeah. We, they, they are being raised as brother and sister. I mean, the fact they're in different houses, we, we, we meet up, we have sleepovers. Um, we had Alice for uh, last Easter. We, we still go on holidays together. You're like a divorced um, couple. Pretty much. Exactly. Without the acrimony and without the nightmare to get to that point. That's it. <laughs> Zero acrimony. And I mean, it's lovely. Um, she's part of the extended family and Richard is part of Julian's extended family. So whereas I went into this as a single man, the one regret was Richard would only have one set of grandparents, which you can look at it and say some people don't only have one set anyhow or yeah. don't have any, but... The way things have worked out, yes, they've actually got a much wider family should they actually ever uh, choose to. And yeah, both sides of the family are massively loving and have taken on, you know. Uh, which is which is amazing. I think it's such an incredible story that, you know, where there's a will, there's a way. And I fundamentally believe that family just needs love and that's what you're providing. And you've you've created your own family around Richard and you're providing him with that pastoral care and family care but that he needs and that's that's phenomenal i mean that's it there is blood family and then there's family you choose yeah these are your friends so my support network the you mentioned you know whether it's uh tina uh amanda um you know I've, two marks literally i'm so incredibly blessed yeah which is which is a multitude of god parents <laughs> <laughs> well, he has seven which is slightly Ridiculous, but Do you know what? No, I, I'd actually argue not. My, the my more mom, the merrier. My mum's a vicar, so um, I did actually ask her. I went, "What are the rules on this?" And she went, "Well, there's not a hard and fast, but you, sh you know, modern society has moved on from being kind of three, and often people will include their partners, so it turns into four. And I'm there thinking, well, do you know what? Can I double that and go for eight? <laughs> I've always wanted to push I, a boundary. I, it was supposed to be six and one person unfortunately couldn't attend because her father was ill and a family friend stepped in and Eleanor has known me since I was little and I was here going, I'm sorry, but you're not just stepping in for the day. You're now stepping in forever. So she literally was like, I'm stepping in for the day. No, you're not. You're here now forever. So six to seven. Yeah. She was a sly move. Love that. Good I mean, for her. Eleanor was um, someone when she first realized I was going through uh, surrogacy as a gay man, had her res reservations. Right. right. <laughs> Enough so that she went and knocked on my parents' door and said that she had reservations. And Oh, wow. She's a good friend. And therefore, you know, honesty is important in friendship. And she felt that, you know, she wanted to at least say. And my parents went, well, yes, but you know Matthew. And yeah, you know, he's gay, you know, he's a good person and he will be a good dad. Yeah. And 
you couldn't have a better advocate. Eleanor, you know, but loves so Richard. This is actually something that I really quite like. You've got a friend who's friend enough to go and talk it through with people that also know you, i.e. your parents, to say, this is what I'm thinking. I don't know enough. Explain to me more about how it's happening. And then has gone, okay, no, you're right. And has changed her opinion on the whole thing. I think that's, if only more people could do that, i.e. the Pope, let's talk about that in a minute. Um, but I think that is such an amazing friend to be yeah. able to go, hey, can we talk about this? And, and what are you thinking? And this is what I'm thinking. And then how can I be here for you? Yeah. That's phenomenal. I mean, this is why Richard's godparents are all people I know that would actually tell me the truth, even if it's the uncomfortable truth. One of his godfathers, Dushnan, when his father passed unexpectedly, I was on the next plane and phoning into work, just going, I'm sorry, I've had a death in the family. I will work remotely because Dushlan is family to me. Yeah. But it's not blood relation. Um, yes, there could have been problems with HR. Um, luckily enough, the company I was working for at the time, um, were willing to bend certain rules and actually go, yeah. But this comes back to choosing your family as well. You've got your blood relations, then your family with choice, which yeah. I think is, is fantastic. Um, so talking about that, a lot of, a lot of your friends are still in the United States. And I know that, um, godparents are in the States. So you take Richard traveling with you quite a bit. I do. You. Yeah. He's been to, I want to say 44 countries now. Um, 44 countries and he's five he's five but and yes we did actually have lockdown in between otherwise it would have probably been an awful lot more but that's amazing showing your child different countries and cultures and experiences and food and i mean have you seen a difference in him after obviously he's growing he's only five in hindsight i realized that some of my way of raising him was a bit of a coping mechanism so as long as raising a child can be very monotonous and the routines and just realizing things don't change. Yeah. And I've always been used to traveling. So especially with work. So, um, yeah, jumping to a new place and suddenly realizing I've got to think of my feet, you know, food, absolutely everything else and make certain it just, it made life easier. And so is it almost a way of mental stimulation for you out of the monotony of baby nappies and feeding and. Yeah, I mean, um, I like I said, heading to Dubai and actually going, Richard loved aquariums. So we hit two of the biggest aquariums in the world. Um, I booked an on off bus to do, uh, the tours one day and we went up to the hotel room after breakfast and Richard, uh, started playing between three levels of curtains on the window and he played <laughs> between these for about an hour and a half. We didn't do the on off bus because <laughs> he was having too much fun. And in, in one of the aquariums, he spent probably 45 minutes dropping a water bottle through a wet floor. <laughs> and you're thinking, there's a shark going overhead. <laughs> you're you're missing. Missing. But that's but, the wonderful thing about children. They yes. see things that we don't see. And they kind of, they, they, I find at least with mine, I always remember when Alexander was probably two, we'd driven out to the countryside. So we, another thing we have in common was Norfolk. We'd driven out to the countryside and I took him out of the car and it was 10 o'clock at night with zero light pollution. And he looked up and he was like, stars, because he'd never seen stars before. He'd seen them in a book or he'd seen them on, in the night garden or, you know, on the TV shows, but he'd never seen them in person. And I just stopped and looked and the, the ability to look at old things with new eyes. Absolutely. It's phenomenal. And I think that's what children teach us old fogies. They do. And it is pretty much each day. I mean, even yesterday, Richard at the moment is going through, Hey, I got a new girlfriend in school today, but we woke up before the end of school, you know, <laughs> very quick uh, <okay>. relationships. <laughs> um, or yesterday it was a matter of, you know, unfortunately, uh, he'd had a falling out with one of his uh, friends, Poppy. And, um, I want you to, uh, take her off the, uh, the birthday party list <laughs> saying this in front of her. And I'm going, Richard, I'm not doing that. You know, you like Poppy. Poppy's coming to uh, your party. You know, we'll talk about this at home. And uh, 
you know, and we did. It was trying to understand why he was feeling the way he was and then actually try to manage that with him. Because yeah. you do, you realize that, hold on, it may seem insignificant to me, but let's try and see the world through what he's doing. And then let's try and, you know, nudge it. Because, fine, she wanted to go on the swings and he didn't. I don't know why. <laughs> that's, a, that's an end of the world event when you're five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh my God, that's so but, um, So yeah, we've hit a lot of countries. Um, I love taking photographs. I, I have a horrendous memory. So uh, everything is documented so that, you know, we can actually see in these books, you know, the maps of where we've been, uh, experiences we've actually done. But a lot of it, he will have been too young for. So I love Tel Aviv um, and go around, uh, you know, seeing so many different places. I want to be able to do that with him later in life and actually go back and see some of these places a second time and see how they've changed. Yeah. So as much as we are taking off countries, it's trying to immerse yourself in the culture, trying to learn. I think that's a phenomenal gift that you're giving him. That's really, really, I mean, it's experiences that he may or may not remember because I remember stuff from when I'm little, you know, not a lot. That there are definitely some experiences. And then with the photographs, it does definitely bring that back. Um, I think one of the things that I would quite like to talk to you about is solo parenting. Um, sure. Is how do you find time for yourself? Because it's very easy to just end up dedicating everything to your child. But how do you find time for yourself and, and dating and all of that malarkey? That is something I probably could be better at if yeah. I'm completely honest, but changes this year would be the fact that, um, having been on the London gay men's chorus waiting list for six years, I finally been accepted. Oh in. They've let you in. They've let me in. Amazing. So thank um, you. London gay men's chorus, which now means that uh, I will actually be, um, beginning that this month, which Fantastic. gives me uh, one day a week where I'll be in London, you know, surrounded by you know gay men and just it's in the same way i love the london front runners you could actually do something that you're passionate about and you can actually be 100 percent yourself but as much as i live my life as an out gay man there are certain things you people censor you know whether it's they're talking about how they met someone you know over coffee or you know and coffee is a synonym for grinder you know, it's purely a matter of... Why are you of... pointing at me? No, <laughs> my hands are doing this. Um, <laughs> we did not meet over Grinder, Matt and we, I. We so did not meet over <laughs> Grindr. Um, it, definitely not. Um, what, what, why not? <laughs> no, excuse me. <laughs> Once again, I'm going red. Um, completely lost my point. You, you're surrounded by people, like-minded people doing things that you love so you can be yourself unfiltered. Yeah. And so I'm kind of looking forward to that. The London Gay Men's uh, Choir, not Chorus. I'm trying to uh, do things for myself. I have a couple of workout sessions with a trainer each week and Yure is absolutely phenomenal. And yes, it is time for me to talk uh, to someone, um, work out, really, you know, leave the gym feeling absolutely buff and <laughs> get a good pump on and yeah it is so easy to just get wrapped up in parenting and especially as you, know, you are very involved with the schools and doing all those different things so i think being able to sit back and go okay what i mean it's something that i want to do this year as well it's like what's going to give me joy even if it's only for an hour or two a week but that's not around my children i mean i love them dearly but i do you know what? I don't think there's a single parent out there, straight or gay, that won't actually turn around and say that, do you know what? We love our kids. Summer holidays or just even half terms, you're there going, oh, crap, I've got all day, every day, and I've got to actually uh, entertain them. And you did that when they were little, but obviously it changes every year, month to month, you know, so you're always adapting. Um, and when they go back to school, you're there going, yes. You know, so I've got really... a few hours to myself <laughs> and it's lovely because yeah, I can 
come into London, I can actually do uh, things during the day uh, and just meet, meet yeah, up and with do things like this. You know, yeah. thank you for being on uh, on this podcast. I mean, it's you are such a wealth of information. You are such a positive, reinforcing person that I I'm remiss in not spending as much time with you as as I should. Um, <laughs> and I think if anybody is interested, hashtag UK rules is his Instagram. Um, cause you know, the UK rules. Um, but yeah, I think I would like to say thank you very, very much for your time today. You have been a great guest. Um, and if there's anybody out there that is thinking about solo parenting, please, please, please let us know because Matt is a phenomenal person to talk to. I am more than happy. I mean, the, the one thing I've actually learned is I have my son because so many people actually gave up their time and were willing to actually help. You pay it forward and I will be forever paying it forward because, you know, I'm forever grateful that I've got him. And that's why we love you. So thank you very much. Thank you.